and my enthusiastic. Give me two claps and a red clear. Woo! All right. <laughs> and y'all still aren't awake. <laughs> Come on. All right, so within recruiting service, like I said, we usually start all our briefings like that because we're always enthusiastic. We're not just salesmen, but this is the way that airmen are supposed to project themselves. With recruiters, we see ourselves, and hopefully you do too, as the face of the Air Force because we are. We're the ones that's bringing the airmen in so that you can continue to train, motivate, and get them out to um, accomplish their mission, right? So what I want to do is, unfortunately, I think that there's a little misconception about what recruiting service does. And we need to make sure that recruiting service is actually telling our story correctly because we need your help. We need your help not only understanding what we're doing, but as you're vectoring your members to become recruiters, we need you to be able to communicate with them on what they're actually getting into. All right, so we're going to be a little bit more vocal in what we're doing because, again, we need your help and we need everyone to understand our part in the Air Force mission. All right, we're going to slide. Uh, do I need to point this a certain way? I'm doing green. You have to be more enthusiastic, <laughs> How about this? <laughs> All right, so. This is pretty simple. Our mission is to inspire, engage, and recruit. Inspire is the big foot stomp that I want to make here. We are not the only ones that inspire people to come into the Air Force. You guys are influencers, and we are depending on you to continue to inspire individuals to come into the Air Force as well. So as you're out there, just remember, when you're wearing that uniform, we look at you as recruiters also. Just because you have a certain skill set or you're in a certain job does not mean you're not a recruiter. So please always keep that in mind. But what I, when it comes to the actual engagement part and the recruit part, of course, you know, that's a little bit more on us as SMEs in being recruiters. But we are depending on you to help us to continue to inspire individuals to come in. But again, that's just our simple mission, to inspire, engage, recruit. All right, I guess, okay, there we go. I wanted to just show you our organization overview because recruiting is a little different. We kind of have the makeup of a NAV, MATCHCOM, and then also a WING. That's why everybody see recruiting service differently. So as you will notice, um, we have an operations division, a plans and resource division, information systems division. So although we don't have an A1, A3, A7, A4, we still have the equivalent. We just call them something else, which is pretty much still the same as what you call in the match comp. And then we have this division that we call marketing. What I do want you to understand is that marketing is not just a recruiting service marketing division. We do marketing for the entire Air Force. For the entire Air Force. I did not know that. And even as a personnelist and actually working with some of the recruiters with their assignments, I really did not understand this piece. So as you're out there and you're asking us, why aren't we doing better with marketing? Well, let me let you in on a little secret. When we went through the cuts, recruiting service took some big cuts in marketing. We have marketers in every group, squadron. But unfortunately, a lot of those positions got cut. So on our headquarters staff, and again, we're doing this for the entire Air Force, we had, when I first got there, we had like four people. So we went from a double-digit number of individuals within marketing down to four. And we're trying to gradually build that, okay? So we're trying to get after the whole marketing thing. Just be patient with us. And I'm going to talk about total force recruiting. And hopefully that will generate more money and more resources so that we can do more and better things. Um, over to the right side, you will see three groups. So this is kind of like the wing concept. Although we don't have wings, we have those three groups. And under those groups, we have 27 squadrons. And of course, these squadrons are spread out all throughout the continental US. And also, we have um, squadrons that are responsible for flights over in the Pacific and also in Europe. If you'll notice, to your right, we have one outlier out there. And this is the 330th recruiting squadron. Well, that outlier is the special warfare recruiting squadron. So we have one squadron that is dedicated solely to special warfare recruiting. They are different, as you guys know. We needed to dedicate resources just to them. What makes it a little bit challenging for us is that we don't have 
all the right skill set to go out and do special warfare recruiting, meaning we don't have recruiters that have or that are SEER, that are your PJs, the CCTs. You would think that we would have those individuals, but we don't. So we are relying on our tier two, tier one, tier two recruiters to go out and do special warfare recruiting. Now we'll say that hopefully it should happen soon that we're gonna get more special warfare recruiters to help us out. Because it's kind of hard for you know, uh, personnel to go out and say, hey, I need you to come into special warfare. And then they start asking all these questions and I don't have a skill set to get them all the information. But of course our recruiters are trained and they'll make sure that they get them um, where they need to be. But again, I just wanted to show you the makeup of what recruiting service actually looks like. And this is why we are a little different because we have the feel of that MASHCOM NAV slash WING concept. All right, then I just wanted to show you a quick map of where we are. So this right here shows you just the squadrons in the group within the continental United States. And again, we, are, we do have um, flights that are out in the Pacific and Europe, and I'm going to show you that in just a second. Now, you'll notice that there are some states that you don't see any recruiting squadrons in. All right, again, this is just squadrons, and this is just groups. So when we go to where all of our facilities are, all right, this right here will show you, we have over 1,000 recruiting facilities. Again, within the continental United States, Europe, Pacific, Alaska. We also have recruiting um, stations in Puerto Rico, and we're about to open, reopen an office in the Virgin Islands. So we're trying to spread out, we're trying to do what we can, but we can't do that without manpower and we can't do that without the resources as far as the infrastructure, which again, we're working on. And for your essay, when it comes to infrastructure, we rely on the Corps of Engineers. And so when the Corps of Engineers, either one, um, don't respond in a timely manner, or two, they don't recommend the locations that we're looking for, then we're just kind of stuck, okay? But when people are saying, hey, if you look up there, for instance, South Dakota, see if this thing works. Oops, uh-oh, that didn't work. All right, so when you look up here in South Dakota, you'll notice that there are recruiting offices on each side of the state. Just because they're on each side of the state does not mean that those recruiters are just responsible for that part of that state. Those recruiters could still be responsible for part of um, this state here. That's Minnesota, I think, I'm sorry. Um, they could be part of, responsible for part of Nebraska, they can be part of uh, some of this North Dakota, and also over here. All right, so our recruiters are responsible for a lot of areas, and again, I'm going to show you what an average recruiter area is responsible for, okay? You'll notice that there's a big cluster over here. Well, we also look at, when we're doing these recruiting stations, that we have to look at the propensity to serve. Right? So we have to make sure that we have recruiters where we know we're going to get those resources. But once we get the manpower, once we can get those facilities, then we can also expand. But that's going to take a minute, and we're working on that. All right. So I do want to show you what the goals look like. And let me tell you up front, these recruiters are making goal. No matter what you hear, we are making goal. It's not the fact that they're making goal, the point that I want to point out here, is how they're making goal. So you, as you will see, these numbers fluctuate, and these are numbers as of 4 March. These numbers go up and down. And when you are manned at 70 and 80 percent, and sometimes lower in different tiers, it doesn't matter. We still have to make sure these goals are met, and we'll do whatever it takes. And sometimes that means taking a tier one recruiter who's only been serving in recruiting for maybe a year, a year and a half, and sometimes we're going to have to make him a tier two recruiter, which means he has double duties. And that can be a big challenge for that individual, but we got to do what we got to do. Um, if you didn't know, I mean, prior service, bringing in those prior service individuals, that is part of our responsibility as well, and a lot of people don't know that either. So when you look at non-prior service enlisted, we are talking about just bringing in a normal, I say normal, bringing in enlisted members, all EA, enlisted accessions. So 32,000 is our goal for this year. Then we, then we also have to get 250 um, prior service people back into our active service. 
Then we break out our officers, so we got the line officer, health professionals, and chaplains. With, yes, sir. Um, push it, hold it. In. Oh, you got it. Yeah, just push it. In. You got it. He was just showing yeah. Me hold it down. I got it. It's it's oh, <laughs> he's a calm guy. <laughs> Go ahead. So anyway, um, we have the fire service cap at 250. Um, is there a thought of increasing those numbers? Because across a lot of our populations, the tech and uh, staff sergeant pools are, numbers are pretty low. So in cyber, some of our staff sergeant AFSCs are 41 percent. Um, so is there a talk of increasing prior service rate? All right. Um, what I failed to do up front, and I apologize, I do want to recognize my four wingmen over here that are recruiters. So um, <laughs> what I'm going to do is uh, he was very eager to answer that. So I'm going to let um, Chief Dixon answer that for you. down at Randolph. So last year she processed and we actually shipped, assessed 512 prior service members last year. So we do get a list from uh, headquarters Air Force to say this is how many specialties for cross training, for example. We fill those first, that's our priority. Then after that we do direct duty. Direct duty is where our bread and butter is, where people want to come back and serve, but it's up to the functional managers to allow them to come back in. So right now we're only 17 away. That was as of last week, so I'm sure it's changed but 17 away from actually assessing our 250 already. So we're on par to go beyond that. So if you know anybody out there that is separated and wants to come back in, tell them to go see the local recruiter. But yes, we don't cap it at 250. Yeah. And that's a great point. Um, these numbers, are this is just the minimum. So we do go over those goals, and you know it's absolutely no issue there. I'll tell you one thing that General Levitt, our commander, her, her discussion when she's talking to someone and they're getting ready to separate we're trying to change that mindset of saying so you're getting ready to separate got it so which branch or which component are you about to go to it's not so what are you going to do afterwards it's which component are you going to and um, as we get into total force recruiting which I'll talk about again this is going to be super important about assessing those non prior I mean those prior service personnel hey, hey chief Lee yes, is sir. the line officer or prior service does that include which one of those include prior service coming in for officer accessions? That would still fall in the line officer category. Yes, any officer coming in, if they're not health professionals or chaplains, they fall into line officer. In any way that we get them in, whether it's academy, ROTC, um, OTS, it falls within that category. All right, great questions. All right. So I wanted to show you again on what an average recruiter's goal and what their area of responsibility is. It's not to poke an eye at our sister services, but I want you to really pay attention to this right here. They have an average of 2,700 square miles that they are responsible for. So when you hear the stories about an individual going to the recruiting office and that recruiter is not there or they can't get a hold of them or whatnot, well, let me put it in perspective. When we don't have, every office does not have at least two recruiters in there. We just don't have the manpower right now. So you will have that one recruiter that is sitting in that office. That recruiter has to go out and do high school visits. They have to do engagements within the community. They have to do all these different things on top of all this traveling. And guess what? That tier one recruiter, he's not doing this by himself. That's why we have tier two and tier three recruiters. You got flight chiefs that also have to go out and make sure that people have the resources that they need, checking on the recruiters for morale, making sure that they're trained properly. On top of that, you got pro superintendents who have to do the same thing. All right, so this is what an average recruiter square mileage is, average. And then also, although it's small, this right here is an average goal for a recruiter. This is a recruiter, when you peel it back, tier one recruiters are the ones who are actually on goal, not tier two, not tier three, okay? So when you look at those numbers, they have to bring in an average of three recruiters a month. Some people think that's easy. 
And I tell you what, you can go out there and try it. You go out there and try to talk to three individuals, qualified individuals to come in, because you can talk to three people and you can probably get like 20 within a month that say that they're interested. But I'm going to show you a chart in a second on how we get down to one individual and all the things that you have to go to through to get there. All right. So when our, when our recruiters, they keep a positive attitude. Again, they're going to do what they need to do. But please keep this in mind that these recruiters are out doing the engagements and they're also trying to get those qualified individuals every month. So when we look at um, the environmental scan. So some of the challenges the recruiter have in getting those qualified individuals. If you look at these stats, it's based on a survey that we did. So 49% of these adults can only name four can name all four of the branches of service. 49%, and these are the people that we're going after. Then you look at it, only 34% of them can actually comprehend what the military does, have any kind of basic knowledge. But what is disturbing is when you look at the numbers at the bottom. So back in 1995, 40% of our parents, or 40% of us with kids, or Anyways, so <laughs> the parents who served, there was 40% of um, parents who served in 1995 would encourage their kids to come in. 14% um, in 2018, I said that wrong. Um, but right now, most of us would not encourage our, our kids to come in and serve. 52% said no. So when you look at that challenge that the recruiters have, and we are wearing this uniform, and we're saying that, hey, I don't want you to join the military, it becomes a huge challenge for our recruiters. A huge challenge. This is, um, this is Air Force. Yeah, this is Air Force. All right, so on this um, left-hand side, this is what you think that, you, that you're getting, well, what we're recruiting. We think that we're getting these structured, you know, individuals coming in the military and that they're ready to conform to our standards. But what you're actually getting is people who have zero military experience. Again, they don't know anything about our core values, nor do they have a common standard of conduct. This is what I was talking about earlier. So let's look at how a recruiter actually gets to a qualified recruit or applicant. A recruiter can get approximately 110 contacts or what we call leads. They can get 110 a month. And when you start peeling that back, um, well, first of all, these contacts, as you can see, can come from different areas. So whether it's you are referring somebody to them, they're going out through high school engagement, somebody's just reaching out through airforce.com, etc. So 110 contacts. Well, we have these five steps. So when you start looking at the pre-screening portion of that, so if these individuals have too many traffic tickets, they didn't even graduate from high school, or maybe they're just too old, so we've already eliminated a chunk there. Then when we actually bring them in and do an interview, then we're looking at things like we find out there's a history of drug abuse. Um, maybe, you know, they're just not a qualified applicant just talking to them. They're not mature enough where we think that they should come in and serve in the Air Force. Maybe they have some of these other disqualifying factors like excess debt, etc. If they make it through that process, then we'll administer the ASVAB test. And believe me, a lot of people cannot pass that ASVAB test or at least score high enough for the Air Force. Eliminate that chunk. Let's send them down to MEPS and do the physical. They get down there, we're going to find out way too many tattoos, um, all these other kind of medical issues. Sorry. Yeah, they're going to have um, all these other challenges that will disqualify them on the physical piece. But if they can get through those four steps, then we're going to put them in a delay entry program. So now they're waiting the ship. In the between that time, because it depends on when the class seats are available, and it also depends on when they are available. So the recruiters are at risk of these individuals changing their mind. They're also at risk of something happening to that recruit. And now they don't have a person to ship. Recruiters don't make goal until they get a person that will ship to um, BMT. That's when they make goal. Not through all of this. Unlike the officers, if they get applications, they're making goal. Okay. For us, it's a little bit different. 
So when they're sitting in the delayed entry program, maybe a great job opportunity came up, so now they changed their mind. Maybe, unfortunately, life you know, happens. Maybe someone got pregnant. Anything can happen here, and now we got to take that person out. So again, it can take a, we can get 110 contacts or leads, but to get down to that one person who's qualified to go, it's, it's challenging. So let's talk a little bit about the actual recruiters themselves. This is just an idea of what an average recruiter looks like. Of course, we get them from the development of special duty process. And as we were talking last night about the whole DSD, you know, we, we want to get away from people saying, oh, you are DSD to go into a special duty. And that's across all special duties. We need to stop looking at DSD as a bad thing. So what I like is you said it's a draft. All right. So they were drafted into the special duty. That's the way we're looking at it, because you're so great, you were drafted. Your leadership team thought that, that you were awesome, and they put you into one of these jobs. But we do need to get away from that concept of this being a bad thing. Now, we are going to ask if we can start opening this up for more volunteers. Um, I don't want to speak for Chief Bass, but when it comes to these special duties, we have a lot of individuals who want to do these special duties, but we're pigeonholing them with this two times a year, vectoring folks and getting them in here, and we need to stop that in our our, our perception or our thoughts on this. Um, so we're going to ask that the AFSEL relook at the whole DSD program and start doing volunteers. Having said though, especially that you guys are chiefs, we can do out of cycle requests. So don't forget that. If you have an individual that's super sharp and you think that they're ready, you need to elevate that so that we can send that forward. And that's across all special duties, okay? I have two right now that I'm trying to work that people said, hey, these guys are sharp. We don't want to wait till the next DSD cycle. Cool. We'll do initial check. If it looks good, then we're going to say, go ahead and get that application and let's do it as an um, exception to policy. All right, but an average recruiter is a staff sergeant. One thing here is that I want you to look at the age. The average age is 30 years old, which is a good thing, okay, because yeah, they're about in that midpoint. We're talking about dealing with 17 to 25 year olds. Sometimes that can be a challenge because maybe we are a little bit more mature and don't know how to relate, okay? But also the age limit for coming into the Air Force is 39. So maybe that age group is actually good to get those other people, those other mature adults to come into the Air Force. But I just want you, I don't want you vectoring people based on age, but I just want you to keep that in mind. Also with the time and service, an average for staff sergeant 10 to 12 years. Think about this, especially as a tech sergeant when you're vectoring them. If you get a tech sergeant into any special duty, but recruiting, we're keeping it at four years right now. If you get a tech sergeant vectored at 15 years, that could potentially be their last job. If we can get them a little bit earlier, I mean, that's twofold there. Hopefully, they'll want to stay in recruiting and we can keep them going. But if not, the whole point of the special duty program is to come in, do this, and take that back and go back out there and continue to um, mentor and, ex and inspire the other individuals, right? It's all about leadership. So think about that time and service because that's some of the feedback that I'm getting as the command chief is that, hey, you know, I was vectored into this job as a tech sergeant when I was at 14 years in. And as you know, with special duties, there, yes, you can definitely get promoted. We know that. But sometimes you might get promoted a little bit later in your career, okay? So keep that in mind for me, please. Um, although we have up here that most, an average recruiter is married with two children, I'm finding out that it's actually probably about three. And that can create challenges, too. Because we're talking about recruiters that are out the majority of the recruiters, maybe 70% or higher, are not near a military installation. So when we start talking about child care, you know, after, uh, after our activities, medical, those things can be a challenge for a person who's just coming into recruiting with these amount of kids. And then you think about their spouse. Their spouse don't have that network, right? So now we're talking about maybe a loss of income, things of that sort. But that's what an average recruiter is. Now, having said this, I want to make sure that I'm clear about this. I may be kind of painting some of the challenges that we have, but I'm telling you, these recruiters are so motivated. 
and they are finding a lot of ways to get after this. So we do, within recruiting, I mentioned child care, there is a, um, uh, um, what is the child care? Child care aware. So the recruiters do have an opportunity to get their child care subsidized. Okay, so we do have a program for them. And I'll tell you that we are going after this whole BAH situation because our recruiters, their BAH, no matter where they are, is based on what is that nearest Air Force or military installation. And it is so not right, okay? We have recruiters that are living literally two hours away from their recruiting office because of uh, schools, because that's what they can afford. And I went out to Chicago we had an individual that was in that situation. And when you have a family with small kids, you have three kids in Chicago, you can't live right there in the city. And if you do, you're probably going to have a super small apartment. You're probably going to be more susceptible to crime. So these are just things that we need to get after. OK. Um, as I mentioned earlier too, these recruiters, they have to get out and they have to do a lot of engagement. So this, this slide here just depicts a lot of the things that they're doing. These recruiters are not sitting behind their desk. They are actually getting out and trying to do a lot of things within the community that, so that they can continue to inspire and engage. Okay, Marketing. Some of the things that they're doing when they're out, some things that you may not be aware of is STEM. Okay, STEM is huge throughout the Air Force, but we're trying to get after this even harder. So we're partnering with organizations such as FIRST. So we'll get out there, um, set up our assets at some of these STEM events, and we're trying to target those high school individuals and trying to get them to come into the Air Force. Um, we do a lot of other things, not just air shows. We're doing snow, you probably heard about snow crawls. We're doing motocross. Of course, we're doing NASCAR, but we're looking outside of the box too. We do Spartan races. We're doing um, some of these fit programs. We just did the NFL experience. Well, we do that the last couple of years we've done those. So we're trying to get ourselves out there and we are not opposed to any kind of event because we need to see where we can insert ourselves and continue to inspire individuals to come in. All right, so how are we getting at the diversity? Our commander stood up a diversity cell, so it's called an attachment one. This particular cell is, again, to focus on diversity, mainly within being, um, the aviation area, so we're trying to get after the pilots here. So this team goes out, and they do a lot of, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of engagements in the communities where we can capitalize on the different diversity. Diversity is not just race. We're talking about gender as well. We also stood up an innovation cell. So this innovation cell is to have a streamlined process for individuals within recruiting to submit their ideas on how we can improve our processes. If you're not aware, if you haven't seen one of these new recruits going to BMT, they don't go with that thick folder anymore. If they go with any pieces of paperwork, it might be two pieces. Yeah, two pieces of paperwork is what they're going to BMT with because now we have that automated within the system and it'll flow down to the BMT. What we're also trying to do, and we're in the process of trying to automate the actual application. I left a folder back there um, in my backpack, but I got a folder of what it, all the paperwork of, that a recruiter actually uses when they're talking to an applicant, and it's about this thick. Well, we need to do better. We need to automate that. So what we're trying to do is kind of like when you buy a house, um, Everything is online, right, or packaged up. So you can go through, read it, do your dig digital signatures or your thumbprints or whatever. So we're trying to, we're working on that, and we're going full speed with it. Um, we have a DEP app. This app is available right now. A lot of you probably didn't know that either, but you can download this. This DEP app, if we tell all the recruits that they need to go do this, what you do, you go in and put your date that you're going to basic training. It'll give you a countdown so that you know what you need to do or just to prepare yourself for basic training. But in there, it gives them information like the Airman's Creed that they can learn in advance, the reporting statement. It has all kind of physical information so that when they get to BMT, they shouldn't be surprised at what the standards are because it's there. And by the way, we have videos in there also that shows them how to do those things correctly. Okay, so download that DEP app, share, show it and share it with everyone because that's good information for you as you're going out and talking to individuals. Um, also, we're working on an Aim High app. Oops, I'm sorry. We're working on an Aim High app. This app is in development in the developmental stages right now. So with this particular app, it's going to 
kind of bring in the family members a little bit more. So what we're going to do is we're testing it right now. It started yesterday with one of the flights down in BMT. We're going to have photographers following around the flight. The photographer will upload pictures, and so the parents can go out and they can look and see what their um, child is doing during week one through um, Airman's Week. All right? And then it also has some other information out there. And then what we're also going to do with this is we're going to have all the events out there. The events that's going to be on this app is the same information that you can get on the AIM High. I'm at the airforce.com website. So if you're like here, you're in Montgomery, and you're like, hey, let's see what's going on Air Force Wise. I can go and just, you know, check out the recruiters or see what they're, what, what they're doing. You can go out there and click on it, and you can find what's going on in Montgomery, the date, the time, et cetera, and go out there and, and participate if you want. Okay? So we always encourage you to go visit a recruiting office and um, get involved as much as you can. However, there are certain things you can't just show up for. Um, if you try to go to the Super Bowl, I think it's in Miami this year or next year, um, you can't just show up if we're there. All right, there's certain things that we have to do, credentials, et cetera. Total force recruiting, so I need to hit this before I get off. Um, we have been directed to make sure that we have one Air Force recruiting agency. General Wilson asked for this to be done back in July of 17. And unfortunately, we didn't make a lot of leeway to that. But right now, we are going full speed. I mean, super full speed. General Levitt has already hired her deputy um, commander, who is a one-star reservist. He should be on board in August, I mean, not August, April, May time frame. We also have a chief that will be in our marketing office that's a, a reservist. So he's going to bring some of that reserve um, expertise and help us get after our whole marketing. So we're still in the initial phases of this, but again, we're going full speed. Um, we don't know what the structure will be like yet. We're working through all of that, but we do know that the headquarters will be in San Antonio. And then, um, you know, again, what the organization is going to be, how we're going to get funding and all that, we're still in those initial stages. But we, again, are going full speed. Having said, we just graduated our first total force recruiting class. So that was huge. And I don't think we did a great job in marketing that so that everyone know. But it was awesome to see all the active duty guard and reserve recruiters in the same class. And when I talked to them, I asked them, you know, what did they think about this? Or do they feel like there's going to be competition? A lot of our recruiters feel like they don't want to have to go out and compete against a guard or reservist. And I'm telling you, that's not the whole point of total force recruiting. Total force recruiting, the point there is to make sure everyone see us as one. Because right now, it's not like the Marines or the Army. When you look at them, you see one component or one service. For us, you see three, technically four, because civilians is in this as well. So civilians will be rolled up into this whole total, total force as well. So what our recruiters are going to do is, if we had the manpower or when we get the manpower, they will all sit together in one office, hopefully. It's not, again, not going to be a competition, but it's about awareness. So when the individual comes in and they see that active duty recruiter, he'll talk to them. And if that person's like, you know, hey, I don't want to serve full time, I want to do part time, all right, then they'll go right here and talk to the reserve recruiter. And we do not expect our recruiters to know every single thing about every single component. That's not the way that, it, again, is supposed to be set up. It's about having everyone see the Air Force as one and not three or four different components. So what can we, um, what do I need your help with? I just want to make sure that we're getting the right airmen at the right time. I will tell you, we are getting a lot of the right airmen, absolutely, and I appreciate it. And when these airmen come in, you ask them, what, did they want to go into recruiting? A lot of them will say no, but then they'll follow up with, I'm glad I did this. This is absolutely amazing. I love what I do. I see the difference that I'm making. So thank you. But sometimes we're not getting them at the right time whether it's the right time in their career, whether it's the right time with their family or life issues. So we are finding out that people are struggling with the whole being separated from a military installation, not having those networks. So I, we could just use your help in making sure that, you know, now that you kind of have an understanding of what the recruiters go through, how they're separated, that maybe you can, you know, consider that when you're doing the vectoring. Um, we are kind of looking at our process a little bit more with interviews. We do want to try to have an actual recruiter do some of those interviews. 
And Chiefs, I forgot to ask y'all, but I, I remember when I was a base level command chief that I had to sign off on those special duty applications. I could have sworn I signed off as a command chief on every single one of them. But I looked at the application. Okay, that's what I thought. So obviously we changed it, which I think is a foul. Um, but I need to make sure that those commanders and those superintendents, not just the first sergeants, but I need to make sure that they're having those conversations and that we're getting the right airmen at the right time because, it's, again, it's not happening. We're finding out people had some marital issues. They were um, already going through counseling. Maybe they had some child issues, EFMP, whatever, and you're still vectoring them into recruiting, and that just may not be the right time because there's no guarantee they're going to be at a military installation. Okay, so we're going to try to look at the whole interview process to include interviewing the spouse because the spouse is an integral part of being of a recruiter. If that spouse is not happy and can't take care of the home, that recruiter is not going to be successful. So those are things that we're going to try to get after. All right. Okay, so again, our success just depends on basically just getting the right airmen, okay? We just need you to help us out. Um, and just remember that recruiting, in order for you or in order for the Air Force to be successful, recruiting has got to get you those bodies. So we have a motto that we say, without recruiter, there are no airmen. Without airmen, there's no, there's no air power. All right? And that is the, the truth. So we got to make sure that we get the recruiters that can go out and get those airmen for you. All right. So I went super long. I apologize. But um, do you guys have any questions? Yes, sir. This thing works. Excuse my voice. I have a cold. I'm uh, Sergeant Hodgson from Luke Air Force Base. Uh, my question is regarding to the uh, tech school that the recruiters go to. Um, what I've heard throughout my time in the Air Force is that the recruiting school is one of the more difficult schools to get through. How has that changed? How are, how are uh, our recruiters being trained today? And is it a high... Uh, um, uh, pass rate or is there people still struggling to get through the school? All right. So the recruiting school, it's funny you say that because I kind of heard some of the opposite, <laughs> that the people feel that we're just letting people go through and we're not getting the right recruiters in the field. Um, our team down there is doing a great job in making sure that they are doing, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, the salesman, you know, they have to go in and they'll do the mock pitch when a person walks into their office and how do they handle it, et cetera. Um, it is not as hard maybe as back in the day, the perception that was there, but it's not that easy either because we don't wanna make this easy for the recruiters because we wanna make it as realistic as possible of the type of applicants that they're getting to walk into their office. Um, so maybe we've relaxed the job, I mean, re the school a little bit. I keep looking over here because I just got in the seat in November and we have um, one of the training office over here who can probably um, talk a little bit more about that. Huge challenge to get through that. Yeah. Uh, very, <laughs> very huge challenge to get through the school. I mean, it wasn't like a PJ washout. I'll tell him. So, because they're recording. Now we still have a few, but it's not quite as bad. What, okay. what we do is um, according to our instruction when someone has an issue they have a grading sheet and the, the grading sheet oh my bad uh, the grading sheet uh, really kind of tells you how well the person did in the school and what they need to work on and focus on and so forth so when we do get those at the squadron level as I used to be a pro suit uh, we kind of look at that report and say okay this young man this young lady has an issue with sales or whatever it is in the process in their training and then when we bring them in, there's a training process when they come in OJT that we put them on and we focus on the issues that they may have. Some of it's public speaking, some of it's uh, just uh, generally confidence or what have you, PT, whatever it might be. Uh, we, we try to engage with that in, in when they come in this way. So, um, yeah, I mean, we're always going to have a few that don't necessarily come through, but it's all about attitude. Attitude is everything. That's our motto. And, uh, yeah, that's how it works. All right, if you guys have any other questions, uh, specifically, the four of them will be here later on. And, um, you know, like we said earlier, it's about networking, right? So make sure that you reach out to them because they'll be out there taking care of your airmen. All right, thank you for your time.